as a young whippersnapper, know-it-all Church of Christ preacher in uh, Gearing, Nebraska, Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. You remember that, don't you, Dennis? And Joe Baker's here. They, they knew me back then. Uh, I, um, I trained at the church where they were at. I was assistant minister. And uh, I got a bunch of the men in our church. I was still uh, somewhat of a patriot then. And I had a, a bunch of men in the church help sponsor a meeting that was uh, going to take place in Scotts Bluff. And they had some speakers come. And one of the speakers was Howard Freeman. And he brought a class on economics. I thought that was terrific. And uh, just about that same time, I had heard uh, Sheldon Emery on the radio and had ordered his material, had looked it over. And it was interesting at first until I suddenly realized, horror of horror, that it was British Israelism. And uh, I, I've said it down. Well, anyway, I met this man, and he doesn't remember it, but I remember talking to him, and he had just got done reading the book, Judas Scepter and Joseph's Birthright. And he started telling me about it. And I said, I said about telling him how that was all wrong and heresy, the whole works. And I don't know if he remember. It must not have soaked in because he went ahead and accepted the identity truth. And here we are both are today. That, don't you think that's remarkable? Let's give Howard Freeman a hand. Okay, you're on. I have uh, one advantage over most of the other preachers uh, and speakers here. I have a whole church full of hard-shell Baptists that are praying for me. <laughs> and uh, uh, for 61 years, I was a hard-shell Baptist, and I was a patriot, and I attended a patriotic meeting in Kansas City. And there was a woman who is right here today, uh, Gerda Cook. Uh, she's back there somewhere, I believe. She has a, a bunch of books. Are you here, Gerda? Uh, she's probably... Right here. Oh, there you are. Yeah, I, I didn't see. Well, uh, they, there were a lot of booths selling books, and uh, her booth didn't have too many people there. And you had to stand about three deep for some of the other booths, so... I figured, well, I'd go there later, and I just thought I'd look over her booth. And somehow or other, uh, she looked like a nice person. I got talking to her, and she says, have you ever read this book? She held up Judas Supper, Joseph's Birthright. I said, no. And uh, she says, well, I would recommend that. And uh, I don't know, she must have said uh, something that got me to buy the book. And I bought the book. And I came home and I read it, and then I immediately wrote her back, and I said, send me all the material you got on that line. <laughs> and so uh, I went from a hard shell Baptist to an identity man just overnight. But of course, I thought, well, if I switched that easy, I wouldn't have any trouble uh, convincing the uh, rest of the people in my church. So I came in with the new idea. I said, boy, you got to get into this stuff. And I started to go full stream at it and uh, in fact what had happened uh, I had perfect attendance for a long time in the church in fact I think I went pretty near 10 years without hardly ever missing a morning or an evening service in the church so uh, they honored me one time for my I had better attendance than anybody in the whole church and so that put me in a pretty good position with these Baptists and uh, once in a while when the minister would take off and out of town, they'd let me have the evening service or something. Uh, just because I was such a good attender, they figured if I'd listened to them all those years, I must be pretty uh, well uh, doctrinated in their doctrine. And so I was, they, they were well satisfied for a few times, but one time after I got to going on this, I figured, well, this is my opportunity. And uh, so the... Uh, I don't know what occasion was. I think the minister was scheduled to go away, but he stayed. But anyway, they said, well, you can have the uh, evening service anyhow. And so I got up and I really told them all about uh, identity, uh, viewpoint and everything. And I think I had quite a few in the audience coming around to my side. But as soon as I got through, the minister came real fast right up and uh, he took the podium and he says, I think uh, Brother Freeman has got into some bad company. 
<laughs> he says, we all must pray for him. And so, as far as I know, they're still praying for me. <laughs> so that, that is the one thing that kind of helps. Uh, I got the identity prayers and I have the Baptist prayers. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, the topic that I usually choose for my talks is, uh, comes from Matthew 10, 16, I believe. Christ said, I send you out as sheep in wolf country. Be ye wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Well, really what I do, uh, I'm just one of the little sheep and I try to help the other sheep survive in this uh, period of time. You know, Christ, he told us we were sheep and we're going in wolf country, but he didn't say that I'm sending you out there to get eaten by the wolves. He says he wanted us to survive in wolf country. He expected us to survive in wolf country. Well, now if we just stop and think, how does a real sheep survive when he's in wolf country? Because we do have sheep living in wolf country all the time. Which sheep is the safest in wolf country? Well, the sheep that is closest to the shepherd because the shepherd has the gun. And when the wolf comes by, uh, the shepherd sees the wolf and he finishes him off and the sheep that's right close by, he's, he's well protected. Well, uh, Christ said, I am the good shepherd. And uh, so that means we ought to stay fairly close to Christ. He also said, I am the truth. And he made it equivalent. I am the truth. So truth is Christ. You can reverse it. And uh, so we must stay close to the truth. And then he said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. So uh, the real thing that we need is to know the truth. And that truth properly presented from a sheep's point of view in wolf country will set us free from the wolves. And this is what I try to uh, teach my uh, fellow uh, citizens uh, how we can use truth right in this wolf country and uh, still be secure right with the wolves all around us. But the one thing we've got to remember, and this is the thing that is uh, hardest for patriots to remember, once they get the truth, they forget their sheep and they think they're wolves. Amen. And they get out there. Uh, now, sheep do not attack wolves. Uh, <laughs> what we must do is when the wolves try to attack us, we just surround them with the truth. And so they can't get through that barrier of truth without exposing themselves as wolves. And this is, it is that little bit of truth that I uh, like to speak to. I just want to show one example. Uh, I guess you all know Erwin Schiff. Uh, he was a fearless fellow. He was dead right. Uh, his uh, book, How to Legally Avoid Paying Income Tax, uh, should have been how to lawfully avoid paying income taxes, or how, no, it's how anyone can avoid paying income taxes. That's what he had. And he uh, sold them all over. He really was making money right and left out of that. And he wrote several others, how to get out of Social Security. And everything he said is true. There's nothing, he had the truth. But he went out as a wolf. And uh, he, he got uh, to, uh, attacking the wolves directly. And uh, now I just want to show what uh, happened. This is by a, a fellow patriot, uh, Andrew Melichinsky. This paper I have is Jurisdiction Journal. It's the latest issue. But this, it, just as it broke uh, Andrew Melichinsky's heart, it broke my heart when I read it. But uh, it just, uh, I'll just read right here. Uh, and the, uh, at the unlawfully delayed sentencing of Erwin Schiff, 
I watched and listened with a heavy heart while Erwin Schiff told the judge that though he was appealing the verdict, uh, he, he was retiring from the battlefield that, and he would start filing income tax returns. He said he was closing down his publishing business and as a part of separating himself totally from the tax protest movement. Now, there is a fellow who had truth, but he forgot he was a sheep and he thought he was a wolf. And there's been many like that, and they've got been, been burned very badly. And uh, I feel sad about that, uh, and we should all. But what I am uh, uh, trying to teach people, and I do it at everything, I want them to know the truth. Now, uh, there was a fellow down to Pastor, em uh, Pastor Peter's church just about a month ago. He didn't have much schooling in... Uh, uh, law, but he got a a traffic ticket. He'd never been in court, and uh, well, it was a picnic. And I says, "Well, if I tell you the first time, you're going to forget it. But uh, get a tape recorder. We'll go off away from the rest of the crowd, and I'll tell you what you ought to do." So uh, he got the tape recorder, and we went off from the crowd, and. Uh, I talked into the tape recorder real fast, and when I got through, he was bewildered. He just couldn't absorb that much so quick. But I said, now go back and listen to that tape recorder. Play it, replay it, until that message becomes a part of you, till you know it with a conviction that you're right. And, uh, well, he did. Is he here today, uh, uh, to, uh, the fellow? Mike is first name. I can't think of his last name. Oh, well, he isn't in the... Oh, he was here. Well, anyway, he went into court, never had any experience, and they dropped the charges against him. So it's the way this can be done if you do it right. Now, the uh, one thing we have to know, there are two forms of government in this country. How many of you know the difference between de jure and de facto? Uh, well, it's very important. Most of you don't. That's a very important thing to know. De jure government is lawful government. De facto government is legal government. Uh, or usurp power. And we have two. Now, within de jure government, we have conservatives and liberals. And within de facto government, we have conservatives and liberals. Now, uh, there's a judge in uh, Wyoming. He's a federal judge, Judge Clarence Bremer. He is a judge and a conservative in a de facto government. And, uh, oh, well, I've had a few experiences with him in the past, but uh, this time uh, there was a fellow having trouble uh, in the court with the Internal Revenue Service, so I wrote a brief for him. Well, uh, he got into court, and I was way in the very back of the courtroom because I knew they wouldn't let me sit up next to him. But anyway, uh, uh, he was reading a little bit out of his brief. Uh, and Judge Bremer was there, and Judge Bremer looked down. He says, did you write that brief yourself? And uh, he says, I told him now, don't tell anybody I wrote this because they'd love to get me for practicing law without a license. <laughs> so uh, he says, yes, yeah, I, uh, I, I wrote it. And Judge Bremer looked very severely at him, and he says, uh, it sounds an awful lot like the style of Howard Freeman. <laughs> but uh, he says, do you know Howard Freeman? He says, uh, yes. He says, well, I just want to warn you a little bit about that fellow. He's probably one of the most dangerous men in the state of Wyoming. Uh, what makes him so dangerous is he looks so conservative, but he's such a radical probably one of the worst radicals we have in this state. 
but he looks like such a conservative. Well, the thing is, uh, from a de facto government, I'm a radical. From a de jure government, I'm a conservative. Now, from a de jure government, he's a liberal or a radical, and from a de facto government, he's a conservative. So, you see, this is where some of this, uh, these uh, name-calling and things comes about. And uh, now the one thing to really understand, to understand uh, the situation, you've got to understand how, what our government originally was and where we are now. Uh, originally, uh, well, I'll go back before our government. For all history, 6,000 years of history, man of one kind or another was sovereign. You had a king who was sovereign. You had an emperor who was sovereign. You had a pope who was sovereign. You had uh, uh, what we have today is legislatures which are sovereign. But in every case, you have men who are sovereign. And uh, what I mean by sovereign, if a sovereign says jump, you better jump or off comes your head. And uh, so that, when you've got that power, you're sovereign. And uh, that continued throughout history until, I believe, uh, Daniel 2.44 says, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. And uh, I believe America was that kingdom. And uh, the strange thing, uh, I just get the way I'm in. Here's the Wyoming Constitution. Very first thing it says, preamble, we the people of the state of Wyoming, grateful to God for our civil, political, and religious liberties, and desiring to secure them to ourselves and perpetuate them to our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution. Highest sovereign is God. Next thing. Se Article 1, Section 1, all power is inherent in the people, and all free governments are founded on their authority. And so we have right here in the uh, Constitution of the state of Wyoming the idea that God is supreme. Man is sovereign under God. Under that comes this Constitution. And under that comes the hirelings of government. They are everyone from the dog catcher to the President of the United States and the Supreme Court judges are all hirelings sworn to uphold this Constitution. That's the way our government was set up. <laughs> that is de jure government in the United States. But what is de facto government? Just turn that upside down. You have a legislature of men is the sovereign. The executive and judicial branch follows the legislature, the legislative branch. They have made them sovereign. Under that comes the people. That's us. And under that, well, uh, well, under the legislature comes us, and under us comes the Constitution, and God is down the bottom if he's even mentioned at all. So, you see, we have the, the same, our government just turned up, our former de jure government upside down is de facto government. Now, you see, a conservative in de facto government wants to preserve the power of the sovereign. And the sovereign, in this case, happens to be the legislature. Well, uh, in other cases, it was the emperor, the king, or Caesar, or the pope, or anything. But Aristotle once said, there's a million ways to be wrong, there's only one way to be right. Paraphrased, there's a million ways to make men a slave, but there's only one way that men can be free. And we established the one way in America for men to be free. We made a few mistakes. It wasn't perfect. We, men weren't totally free as they could have been, but we did 
as close as you'd expect men to do. They don't ever get too perfect in the way they uh, do things. So uh, we, we got about as good as we could get. But we do have uh, the best government that ever came, and I am sure, I feel certain, that this government, it, which is the only government in all history that was ever set up in the proper status with God the sovereign, the people sovereign under God, constitutions, and hirelings of government at the bottom, uh, that system won't vanish from the earth. I, I feel certain that God could not allow it. But now, temporarily, we're in this de facto government, and what can we do about it? Well, I want to show you how even the government, the very things that we criticize, has some good in it, and we can use that good. Uh, the law merchant, uh, you hear about the law of merchants and how these merchants are bad and all that. Well, they may have grown that way, but when things started out, they weren't that bad. Uh, and you, you want to see their point of view uh, a little bit, so I'm going to argue the other side a little bit before I show the perversion. But the other point of view is this. If formerly, if a merchant in Germany, say, he had uh, German watches and he wanted some English Sheffield steel knives, well, he would make a trade. He said, I'll send you a shipload of German watches if you return a shipload of uh, uh, Sheffield steel knives. And the shipload of German watches arrives in England and uh, they unload them. And then this fellow on the other side, he says, well, just a moment. I think I'll just send that ship back empty. He can't do anything to me. He's a German citizen. He can't come in and use our laws to sue me. I'm an English citizen and he has no access to our law. So I'll just send the ship back empty and I won't give him the knives. And so the ship arrives back em empty. Well, this didn't please the merchants. And uh, they said, well, we've got to have honesty. We can't trade if we don't have honesty. But we have no way of enforcing uh, international contracts. Uh, uh, this is, is not a good situation. So the merchants got together and they set up the Hanseanic League and they all contributed into it and the principle of it is something that every one of us could accept. The key principle in the Hanseanic League, the uh, law merchant uh, codes that were set up, is that a merchant's word is as good as gold. Now, that was their principle. But, you see, just having a principle like that with no way of enforcing it was a little bit difficult. So, they set up their own uh, uh, enforcement agency and suppose that happened after that. The English merchant didn't send an empty ship back. He took emptied all the clock watches off and never sent the Sheffield steel back. Well, the, law, uh, the Hanseanic League would go and they'd hire some criminals, the worst hoodlums they could find, and they'd say, we'll give you so much money, you kidnapped that Englishman that didn't return the, uh, the shipload of knives to us. And they'd go in and they'd kidnap them. And then they'd get them into a field, say, in Denmark, a farmer's field in Denmark. They always picked a country that wasn't involved. The, the fight now is between England and Germany. Well, they go over to Denmark, they'd find a field. They were called the courts of the dusty feet. And they would get in this, this field at daylight, and all they had to prove was, did this merchant or did this not merchant not keep his word? And they, they just proved the fact the merchant did not keep his word. They chopped his head off, left his body and his head severed. And they took off and the farmer would come down and he'd see this uh, dead body with a head off in his field and report it to the sheriffs. And maybe they would leave a note on the body saying this merchant did not keep his word. Well, uh, 
of course that got out but and uh, the uh, but the individual governments didn't like that they didn't like these dead bodies found, uh, found on their uh, farmers fields and one thing or another so uh, finally it got so that the merchants got each government to use uh, the permission to use their courts to enforce their international contracts well up to that point everything was good but now what has happened uh, the evil forces of the world or the wicked men decide well we can use this to our advantage and so uh, uh, well uh, the, to make a lot, I wanted, I could go on here for hours, but I see, time, boy, time gets away from me awful fast. Uh, I got to speed up. Uh, there is, eventually, the, uh, uh, in 1040, uh, with William the Conqueror, the merchants got a square mile called the City of London. Now, you have Metropolitan London, and then you have the City of London. Well, the city of London has its own police, and even the Queen of England can't walk in there if uh, they will not give her permission to go in there. That is territory of the merchants of the world alone. That's where their cases are tried. Any murder that occurs in the city of London is tried by their own police and in their own courts. They have their own territory there. And so any merchant that doesn't keep his word can be tried in the city of London, but nowadays we have now got the other governments to do that. Well, now this is the, uh, the good part of the law merchant. As I say, the, prince, the general principle of a, a merchant's word is as good as gold, and we couldn't ask for anything more as Christians than that. And so that in itself is not bad. But you'll notice there is a different thing here that when you're enforcing contracts, you enforce the contract on the letter of the contract. The exact letter of the contract is enforced. You have no constitutional rights in a contract enforcement. You, when they're, uh, if you contract to do a thing and you don't perform according to that contract, uh, you can be fined or uh, penalized in some way. And you don't have, uh, you can't demand jury trials or anything else. Of course, under American contracts, now you see, our Constitution provides for these things. We have uh, courts set up to enforce criminal actions, common law courts, and we uh, also have equity courts. Well, an equity court is to enforce contracts, obligations. Now, uh, uh, a court of equity is a court of compelled performance. The jurors, uh, they uh, compel performance upon people. Now, you've got to learn the difference between law and equity. Law does not compel anybody to do anything. At law, you're free to do anything you please, provided you do not infringe upon the life, the liberty, or property of anyone else. If you back out of your garage and you uh, bump into the side of the car, of the car across the street, uh, uh, well, you damage his car, and then if you drive away, you injured him and he gets your license number or something and he calls the police and he will file a complaint. You damaged him. You backed your car into the side of his car and pushed the whole side in. Well, he should be given damage. All he has to do, he swears out a complaint that he's damaged. The police grab you, they bring you into court and all he has to do is prove that you were the fellow that backed into his car and uh, the court will order you to pay damages. But that's where law ends. You see, it's only when you damage someone else. But if you don't damage anybody else's life, liberty, or property, you wouldn't even know law existed. It just is there, but it doesn't bother you. 
So, but equity is a jurisdiction of compelled performance. Now, uh, the trouble is that our language has become confused, and so when you get, uh, we uh, have what they call a law that compels you to buckle your seat belts, whether you want to or not. Now you know that that's not law. Law does not compel anyone to do anything. You're free to do anything you please, provided you do not infringe upon the life, the liberty, or the property of anyone else. That's law. Law only gives damages and it doesn't compel performance. Well then, you know that that's not law. But if that state policeman comes up and he says, you disobeyed the law. The law says that you must fasten your seatbelts and I'm here to uphold the law and I want to arrest you and bring you into court. Well, right off the bat, you know that he doesn't know what he's talking about. But probably most of the judges don't know what they're talking about either. But you have to presume they have, and you have something to uphold them on. We have the Magna Carta, and uh, Article 45 of the Magna Carta, I always remember this, two good parts of the Magna Carta, 38 and 45. Do you ever think of a 38 revolver and a 45? <laughs> well, uh, uh, there's a couple of other ones. 24 and 39 are also good, but I always start with uh, 38 and 45. But uh, 45 said, we will only appoint such men to be ju judiciaries, constables, sheriffs, or bailiffs, that means hirelings of government, as know the law of the land and will keep it well. Now, they, when they swore their oath of office, uh, they, uh, this is binding on them, just as much as the Constitution, because the Constitution recognizes the Magna Carta and all the rest. So they should know the law if they don't. You know what they do with you. You say, well, I didn't know that the law uh, required me to fasten my seatbelt. They'll say, ignorance of the law is no excuse, uh, okay? Ignorance of the law, as far as they're concerned, is no excuse either. And uh, one of the things that you want to do uh, is to work each step timely along the way. Your first thing is to question jurisdiction. That is the first move. Now, how do you do that? You don't bother with a policeman. Uh, he's... Uh, they're all brainwashed and nothing is on record. What you want is the record of the court. Now, I want you to think of this. Most people in this country uh, watch TVs and Western movies and all the rest of it. And in all of those things, there are good guys and there are bad guys. Now, when you get into a court and there's a jury sitting in that court, the jury uh, they, you remember, they've been watching television and all this, and they know that in every situation there's got to be some good guys and there's got to be some bad guys. And generally think you've got a little prejudice to start with because if the government is against you, well, they figure, well, he must be bad or the government wouldn't be against him. So that's, you've got that a little bit against you. But what you want to do is start in the very beginning. You want to have a record uh, a court where there's a record and you want to constantly work on the idea that I'm going to establish that record in such a way that anyone who reads that record is going to know who the good guy is and who the bad guy is. I'm going to be the good guy, they're going to be the bad guy. So you make that, uh, that's your first motive, uh, you start with a record. So you get into court and the judge will read the statute to you. You're down here and he's up here. And he says, well, uh, Mr. Freeman, uh, you are charged. Well, I had this recently. Uh, you are charged with uh, a violation of Lusk City Ordinance number 12207, which reads as follows. No vehicle, motor vehicle shall be driven south on Maple Street. And do you understand the charge, Mr. Freeman? No. Mr. Freeman. <laughs> please, 
please don't insult the intelligence of this court. A man of your caliber certainly knows that, that understands that charge. And I said, no, Judge, you don't understand what I don't understand. <laughs> the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution requires you to tell me the nature and the cause of this action which is against me. And uh, I wouldn't, if I, now, uh, I don't know how to defend in this case. Now, Article 1, Section 10 of the Wyoming Constitution tells me I have a right to defend myself in this court. But uh, unless I know the nature and the cause of this action that's against me, I can't properly defend. And I think uh, it's only fair that you should tell me the nature and the cause of this action that's against me. In fact, I have the authority of the Sixth Amendment for asking this question. And uh, you say, well, what is it you want to know? Well, you always ask him the easy question first. See, uh, uh, it, see the, uh, the state can't come after you civilly. Uh, the Constitution, the Supreme Court of the United States has, has a jurisdiction, uh, the court of original jurisdiction, if a state comes after an individual uh, civilly, if they have a civil dispute with you, well, they can't use their court to settle it. Uh, they, they would be a prejudiced court. So the Constitution saw that, so they put that up in a federal court. And uh, the state doesn't want to try all their problems in federal court. So they don't ever come after you civilly. They come after you criminally. But uh, most people don't know that uh, if you just fail to fasten your seatbelts, you're a criminal in the eyes of the state, not a, not a that isn't a civil crime, that's a criminal action. And uh, so uh, you ask him the easy question first. Is this a civil action or a criminal action? He, he'll, he'll very quickly answer, but you see, you got him answering now under the authority of the Sixth Amendment. He said, it's a criminal action, Mr. Freeman. Oh, well, thank you very much. Let the record of this court show that this particular action against Howard Freeman is a criminal action now, uh, Judge, there are two criminal actions authorized in the Constitution of the United States. One is a criminal action under a common law jurisdiction, and the other is a condition of contract under the criminal aspects of an admiralty jurisdiction. Now, uh, would you tell me, Your Honor, uh, which jurisdiction is this court operating under? a common law jurisdiction or an admiralty jurisdiction. Now, there are four answers. Well, uh, just uh, last night I heard of four and a half answers. <laughs> there's an, uh, still another one. But anyway, there's, there's four answers. I'll give you the four and then I'll maybe get into the, the half one. Uh, the first thing, uh, uh, and this happened in my case, he says, oh, Mr. Freeman, he says, uh, Admiralty stops at the high water mark. Of course, this is common law jurisdiction. Uh, I, I wish you'd get an attorney. And uh, I said, uh, fine. Well, let the record of this court show that this particular criminal action against Howard Freeman before this court is a criminal action under a common law jurisdiction. Now, that is set in concrete in the record of the case. And then uh, you start in, well, the court, uh, uh, if he doesn't, now remember, I'll give you one little trick. If you fail to claim your rights, the court, uh, the Supreme Court has declared this, every legalism will be presumed lawful unless timely and specifically challenged for its lawfulness. Now, you got to know the difference between legal and lawful. I'll try to give it to you very quick. Anything is legal. If I have a gun here, and I, it isn't a concealed weapon, and I just pointed at Dr. Pickett over here, and, uh, and there's a policeman over here, but I just pointed at it, and I get up a little closer to him, and I say, give me your wallet. Well, he's looking down the barrel of that gun, 
everything. So he just digs in his pocket and he hands me the wallet. And uh, so I put the gun away and he, he walks that way and I put his wallet away and walk this way. Policeman can't do a thing. What I did was perfectly legal. And it, what he did, he waived his right to challenge my legalism for its lawfulness. Now all he needed to do was to turn to the policeman and he'd say, did you see what that man did? He took my wallet at the point of a gun and uh, I'm complaining. Immediately the officer comes over and he grabs me by the collar and he arrests me, bring me into court and yeah, there's a law against uh, uh, taking a man's wallet at the point of a gun. So I go to jail, just what I deserve. But you see, if he hadn't claimed his right to that law, he waived his right. And this is the way they treat us all along. If we don't know our rights, anything the government does is legal. And uh, the thing is that most of what they do is not lawful. But if you don't know the difference between legal and lawful, you're going to be in trouble. I notice there's a, a, a van over, or trailer over here. Ooh, five minutes left, boy. Well, I'll get some more tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, there is a van over here. It says we uh, will show you how to legally avoid paying income tax. Well, that is worded wrong. What they should say, we will show you how to lawfully uh, avoid paying income tax, but legally they may try to put you in jail. <laughs> so then you get the, uh, the real difference between lawful and legal. Well now, that's the thing, they use it against us, but we can use it against them. Now, when you get them, you make a statement in court, and if they don't challenge it, you've got a prosecuting attorney over there. If he doesn't challenge it, he's waived his right to challenge it. See, every legalism uh, will be presumed lawful by the courts unless timely and specifically challenged for its lawfulness. Now, if you say that this, uh, let the record of this court show that this court has declared that this particular criminal action against Howard Freeman is a criminal action under a common law jurisdiction and that judge or that prosecuting attorney doesn't challenge it at that point, you've set it in concrete that court is a common law jurisdiction court. Now, uh, once that's set in concrete, you've got no challenges, then you start with your defenses. And you, the first thing you can say, well, I move that the case be dismissed because there is no cause of action uh, for uh, this court to gain jurisdiction, a common law criminal jurisdiction in this case. But where is the injured party? Who is the party of interest in this case? Well, the officer. Ah, Magna Carta 30... Uh, uh, 38. Yep. Yeah. Over here. No hireling of government, it says bailiff, but you read that hireling of government, for the future, uh, shall for the future put any man to trial upon his simple accusation without producing credible witness to the truth thereof. So uh, here's this hireling of government over here. He's, he's uh, bringing a charge against me. Well, uh, uh, where, who is the witness appearing against me? He is. Uh, have you been injured? Uh, no. Have you sw sworn a statement that you have been injured, that there's been damage done? No. There's no corpus delecta. Well, right in the Wyoming Constitution, under our right to uh, defend, here we have... Uh, well, it speaks here, uh, it speaks of the right of the accused to defend. And it says, when the location of the fence cannot be established with certainty, venue may be placed in the county or district where the corpus delecti is found. Well, corpus delecti means dam a dead body 
or damaged body or damaged something is found. So there has to be damage before a common law court has a common law jurisdiction. So there is no damage. Well, uh, I'm, I'm going to stop very quickly now, but uh, uh, that is the first step. You see, what you have done, you have established the that the court has not jurisdiction because there is no damaged party and at law there must be, you're at law you're free to do anything you please provided you do not infringe upon the life, liberty, or property of anyone else. Now you've shown here that there, and it's right in the record of the court, you're the good guy and there's no damage and they haven't shown any damage, so they're the bad guy at that point. And that's where I'm going to leave you tonight, uh, today, and tomorrow I'll pick up from there and show how you keep making them the, a little worse and a little worse and a little worse and yourself a little better, a little better, and a little better. And Could you listen to this guy all day? Yeah. We'll try to work him in again here, maybe one more time when we play him. Several people were. You know, it's pretty hard to please everyone because everyone wants to hear so many people so many times during only so many hours in the day. We're adjourned for 10 minutes. Better get my watch out. You know, I tried to bribe Pete. I brought a pillow, and I uh, says that when I talk, I know those seats get hard, Pete. I, you could sit on this pillow, and uh, Pete wouldn't be bribed. He says we still got the rope, <laughs> so somebody else is using my pillow just for this my talk. <laughs> You know, these seats get kind of hard after a while. You, you notice that. Well, uh, yesterday I mentioned uh, that there were conservatives and liberals in de facto government and conservatives and liberals in de jure government. Well, somebody uh, cornered me on that. They said that was a little bit confusing. What uh, would you kind of clear that up a little bit. Well, I did define what de facto government is, is what we have today. It's really usurp power. And de jure government is what we should have, what we had at the time of the founding fathers. De jure government puts God at the top, that God is the ultimate sovereign, man is sovereign under God, and then comes constitutions, which is our real government, and uh, then comes the hirelings that are all sworn to uphold the Constitution. That's de jure government. Now, de facto government is the same thing turned upside down. Uh, you have man as sovereign, whether the man is an emperor, a king, or it could be the legislature, it could be the pope, that is sovereign, then uh, under that uh, you have man, that's us, and under that uh, the citizens, and under that the Constitution, and at the bottom is God. That's de facto government. Well, now, uh, uh, let's see, the names are terrible. Uh, the fellow who nominated me uh, to be uh, Watson, Mike Watson, yeah, Watson. Uh, Mike Watson uh, named me for Supreme Court, you know, <laughs> if he was president. Well, now, uh, I would say that he was always a conservative under de jure government. But you see, he was brought up under de facto government. And he 
rebelled against de facto government and that temporarily he was a hippie until he heard of de jure government and then he became a conservative. So you see in each of these types of governments you have de facto, uh, you have a, a liberal and a conservative and in de jure government you have a liberal and a conservative. And uh, so the judge who uh, is ruling in de facto government uh, considers himself a conservative. And the thing that bothered him so much is the fact that I looked so conservative, but I was so radical. Well, I was radical from his point of view, uh, because as his, from his point of view, conservative is what maintains his $65,000 a year salary, all the amenities of office, and all kinds of uh, uh, pensions later on and honors and so on. That, that, to preserve that, is to him conservatism. And uh, of course, Mike uh, Watson was a rebel against that, so he was the radical under de facto government. And, uh, but now you see to a conservative in de facto government, a conservative in de jure government is a radical. They can't tolerate that. And uh, a radical in de jure government would uh, fit very well over in de facto government. So this is the, uh, if that clears it up, maybe uh, that, that will help. But uh, uh, there is a conservative and a, and a uh, radical in each form of the uh, uh, government. And one is de facto one is de jure. Now, uh, uh, yesterday I uh, left off, I was uh, giving the uh, four ways that the, uh, what you will face when you come into a court and the proper timing for a proper approach to turn a, an equity situation uh, into a law situation or have it dropped. Now, uh, when you uh, go into court, I'll just roughly go over it. Uh, the very first thing that happens when you go into court is the, you will come up before the judge and you will be arraigned. This is not your trial, this is just arraignment. They're just going to read the charge to you and ask how you plead on the charge. And so you will be brought up before the judge and he will uh, pick up the citation or whatever it is. Now this does, it's not only traffic offenses, it's IRS, I don't, uh, any other offense that you may have against the uh, government, uh, so-called the de facto government, they will read the uh, charge that uh, you have and uh, the judge will say, you are uh, charged with violating section so-and-so of certain statute, which reads, and then he'll read the statute to you, and uh, in my case, he says, you were charged with violating section 12207 Lusk Ordinance, which reads that no vehicle, a motor vehicle, shall be driven south on Maple Street. Do you understand the charge, Mr. Freeman? They will always have to ask you in any court, they will say, do you understand the charge? And they expect you to say yes. And of course, my advice is to always say no. <laughs> and uh, now you do not understand the charge. And then of course the judge, as he did in my case, he said, oh, Mr. Freeman, please don't insult this court. You, you know that you drove the wrong way in the one-way street. Now, please be reasonable. And I said, no, Judge, you don't know what I don't know. And uh, I said, now, here's the where you start. The Sixth Amendment re to the Constitution requires you to tell me the nature and the cause of this action that's against me. And uh, I, that I need to know in order to make my defense. I can't uh, uh, defend 
unless I know uh, the nature of the court that I'm defending it. Uh, and I am allowed to defend myself. And yet I have to know this. So the Constitution provided a way that I can know and gives me the authority to ask you, what is the nature and cause of this action against me? And uh, he said, well, what did you wish to know? Well, they will say that. And you always ask the easy question first. And that is, is it a criminal action or a civil action? And, of course, if it's anything from the administrative agency of government against you, it'll probably be a criminal action, uh, court, especially state. Now, when you get into federal, you could have civil, but a state, it'll be a uh, uh, criminal action. So then what you do, you set, set, set the record by turning to the court recorder and saying, let the record of this case show that this is a this particular case is a criminal action against Howard Freeman and now if there's no uh, response from the bench that's set in concrete all right then uh, you turn to the judge now you've got him answering see that's the trick uh, uh, is to get him answering you he answered under the authority of the sixth amendment that question now you ask him the hard question now, well, you uh, turn to him and say, well, now, uh, Your Honor, you know that there are two criminal actions authorized by the Constitution of the United States. One is a criminal action under a common law jurisdiction, and the other is a condition of contract under the criminal aspects of an admiralty jurisdiction. Would you please tell me which jurisdiction this court is operating under? Well, that's the tough one. They don't want, they're operating under admiralty, but they don't want to admit it. So uh, uh, they will answer four different ways. Now, I will give you the first way. He will say it's a criminal action under the common law. Well, if he says that, then uh, you probably got the case uh, finished right there because under the common law, there is no criminal action against a sovereign citizen unless another sovereign citizen brings a charge. A hireling cannot uh, charge his sovereign. Uh, it, you find that out in ordinary employment. If you're working for the boss, you can't charge the boss with uh, not doing his work right. Uh, he can charge you, but you can't charge him. So. Uh, these are hirelings here, and a hireling can't come and charge a sovereign with violating the law. But if another sovereign complains against you as a sovereign, uh, then uh, if he's willing to sign a complaint that he was injured by another sovereign, then the uh, officer is authorized at that point to arrest a sovereign and bring him into court and if this other sovereign can prove his complaint, then the, uh, the first sovereign must pay damages. But that's, that's common law. Well, now, uh, if it was just an officer arrested you for speeding or for driving the wrong way on one-way street or any other charge, uh, he has no authority under the common law to arrest any sovereign. So uh, uh, you, the case should be dismissed immediately. You say, well, who is the damaged party? There's no damaged party. Well, if there's no damaged party, there is no cause of action for the court. And so the case should be dismissed. Well, if they didn't dismiss it at that point, you've got so many other things. Now, they would have to prove under the common law in a criminal action they would have to prove willfulness. They would have to prove that you willfully drove above the speed limit or that you willfully drove the long way because there, uh, it is not a crime to accidentally do something. It, uh, the element of willfulness enters it. Uh, even the uh, Internal Revenue Service, that's one of the strong points we have. They got a little bit of common law mixed up with admiralty in that seven 
7304, I guess, uh, charge willful failure to file. See, it's willful failure. Failure to file is not a criminal action. It's got to be willful failure to file. And uh, so that is the way. Now, in a traffic offense, the only way they could get willfulness is to give you a warning. Now, for example, if I'd been driving the wrong way in a one-way street, the officer comes up and he says, did you know that was a one-way street? No. Well, I'm telling you it is. And this is an official notification that uh, that is a one-way street going north and you don't go south on it. Now, if the next day I did the same thing, that would be a willful violation. And that would be uh, a criminal action under the common law. But the first time it's not willful. So uh, there's another aspect. Well, the point is you should dock it right out as a common law uh, action immediately. In, in, the, in the common law, you're entitled to due process of law. The Constitution says in all, doesn't say some, all criminal actions, uh, there shall be a jury trial. And uh, most of these court cases, they don't. And in a common law jury, it's 12. Whenever you see a six-man jury, you know it's admiralty. It's not a common law jury. The common law jury is 12. Or well, all this is part of your rights to due process of law under the Fifth Amendment. And uh, so the minute he says the jurisdiction, it's a criminal action under a common law jurisdiction, the case should be dismissed immediately. And eventually it will be. They, they can't carry it on event, uh, into, you know. Howard, can you tell me what is the report? What type of report is it by the nature of the bias? Well, that, uh, I understand the uh, uh, board, the yellow border around the flag uh, represents an admiralty court. But you see, what happens, all our courts are admiralty courts today, but the judges take silent judicial notice of that fact, but they don't tell you. And they'll let you come in and make all constitutional defenses in this admiralty court, and they'll deny everything. And you say, well, how could he do that? Uh, he's sworn to uphold the Constitution, and uh, uh, how can he uh, deny me all these unalienable rights? Under the Constitution, they're denied, or right offhand. How does he do it? Well, you see, you cannot use common law or, uh, or constitutional defenses in an admiralty court. Admiralty has its own defenses. Common law has its defenses, admiralty has its defenses. But you see what they secretly do, they s silently take judicial notice that you're in an admiralty court, you come in with constitutional defenses and everything is thrown right out, out and you can't understand it. Well, I went through all that, this is the way we have to learn by the hard way. And a good many of us have learned the hard way that uh, what is taking place. But now remember, uh, uh, the one key to all uh, law, is, uh, the way it's, the procedure of law, the way it's practiced today, is that every legalism will be presumed lawful by the courts unless timely and specifically challenged for its lawfulness. So if you don't ask what the jurisdiction of the court is and you assume it's a common law court and you make common law defenses and they're all denied, at that late date, you can't ask, well, what was the jurisdiction of this court? You've waived your right to do it. You didn't make a timely and specific challenge to this legalism. So they can assume that the court is an admiral. The judge takes judicial notice of that, and if you didn't ask him what he's taking judicial notice of, well, uh, you'll wind up uh, in an admiralty court and think you're in, in a, cons a common law court. And so that is the uh, thing that it's so important uh, when, you, when he reads the charge right at that moment uh, in the arraignment, you, uh, you will say, do you understand the charge? And let the record show that you did not understand the charge. 
and they can't go after you if you don't understand the charge. So they've got to keep explaining until you understand it. All right, now, the Sixth Amendment gives you the right to know the nature and the cause of the action that's against you. You use that. And, of course, as I say, you ask the easy question first. And uh, after, once you've got them answering under the easy question, then you come up with a harder question. Now, I've told you what you do if he says it's a, a common law, a criminal action under common law jurisdiction. Immediately, as soon as he says that, turn to the court reporter and say, well, let the record show that this particular criminal action against Howard Freeman is a criminal action under a common law jurisdiction. Now, if the judge doesn't, now you can use that same, every legalism will be presumed lawful unless timely and specifically challenged for its lawfulness. You state that, and if he doesn't uh, challenge you at that and correct it, that's set in concrete in the record. It, no other court can change it because the other courts are just reviewing what happened in that first court. And uh, maybe I better answer questions afterward because it will be on the tape, yeah. Uh, well, the, uh, uh, the next way that they will answer, this is way two. The judge will say, well, I'm sorry, Mr. Freeman, but I'm not here to advise you on law. I would suggest that you get a uh, licensed attorney and uh, he will give you the answers to these questions. Well, say, Your Honor, but the uh, Constitution, the Sixth Amendment, gives me authority to ask the nature and the cause of this action against me. Now, it would be injustice if I am forced into a court uh, and I can't, don't know what jurisdiction the court is operating under because I wouldn't know how to make my defenses. And uh, I think it would be uh, only fair that you would do it. But if that is your opinion, well, let the record of this court show that this is a criminal action against Howard Freeman under a secret jurisdiction known only to licensed attorneys. Do you see what you've done to him there? And boy, he's got to challenge that. that. That would put him on the spot right there. So the, what he will then do, he'll switch it over. And he'll say, well, uh, Mr. Freeman, this is a uh, uh, statutory jurisdiction. And you'd just be a little surprised. Oh, I didn't know about those. Uh, but... Uh, See, you always want to, you remember, you're always the nice guy. All this is on record, and when somebody reads the record, they want to know who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. So you're the good guy. And so you never implied, you know, you, he says it's a statutory jurisdiction. Says, well, I never heard of that. Of course, I don't know too much about law, but I am willing to accept a statutory jurisdiction. If you can uh, tell me, where can I get the rules of criminal procedures under statutory jurisdictions? There is no such thing. <laughs> so if there is no published work, uh, you ask the judge now, could you tell me, I, I've looked around, but I, I haven't been able to find the rules of criminal procedure under statutory jurisdictions. Do you have a copy that you could loan me, Judge, or something so I can be prepared to defend under this unknown jurisdiction to me? But see, he can't do it. And then he will again turn say, well, Mr. Freeman, I would advise you to get the services of a licensed attorney. And uh, then you just turn right back to number two again, and you say, well, uh, it appears that the court is operating under a secret jurisdiction known only to licensed attorneys. And yet, now if I were in Wyoming, I would open my uh, thing, uh, Article 1, Section 10, gives me the right to defend in a court. Well, if I am given a constitutional right to defend in the court, and the court won't tell me the jurisdiction 
I, that the court is uh, the rules of that court by which to defend, and they're known only to licensed attorneys, and there's no published for the public to know. You see, you got them in a bad position there. And usually, well, right at that point, I believe the other case, the prosecuting attorney, uh, this case, uh, this Mike uh, uh, Long, uh, here he is back here. Then the judge say, uh, well, or, or no, the prosecuting attorney say that, well, there isn't enough in this case to be worth uh, prosecuting or something, and they, they just drop it. So that, that ends the uh, thing right there, because he doesn't want to prosecute it. So uh, that takes the judge off the hook if the prosecuting attorney uh, relieves him of the, the responsibility. Now, you've got three. First is he will tell you it's a common law jurisdiction. The next one, he will tell you uh, only, uh, you better see a licensed attorney. And the third time, he'll say it's a statutory jurisdiction. Now, the fourth, suppose he says... Yes, suppose he's honest. Most of them aren't honest because they, they want to get you. But suppose he's honest. And he says, yes, Mr. Freeman, this is a, an admiralty jurisdiction. Then you say, well, Judge, uh, that's very nice. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, but you know that there is no admiralty jurisdiction for any court in America unless there's a valid international contract in dispute. And I'm not aware that I've ever entered any international contract, and so I would deny that any such contract exists. And then you turn to the prosecuting attorney whose job it is to prove jurisdiction in the court. You see, the plaintiff always has to prove that the court has jurisdiction to hear it. So you turn over to this prosecuting attorney and say, uh, I deny that the, I have entered any valid international contract uh, and that there's any contract in dispute in this case. And judge, I would have you order this prosecuting attorney to prove as a fact of law that a valid international contract is in existence that I am a party to that international contract and that my being a party to that international contract obligates me to drive only uh, north, or no, only, uh, uh, yeah, only north on a one, this one-way street. In other words, to obey this ordinance. Well, now the average prosecuting attorney couldn't do that. And so, but it takes the onus off the judge's back and he'll turn to the prosecuting attorney well prove it well uh, he will drop out at that point because he, he most of them just don't know the law that's all and they just couldn't do it so uh, he, he's stumped right there uh, I'll answer questions later uh, off the tape I, I think better uh, so anyway that takes uh, uh, that, But suppose you've got a good prosecuting attorney. Suppose he is one who's going to lose his license to win this case. He's not going to back down. Uh, uh, he's going to come right through. And he says, well, uh, there is a valid contract in existence, international contract in existence that involves Mr. Freeman. And I'll tell you, this is the way it, it came about. When Roosevelt was elected by the citizens of the uh, United States, he was elected by popular vote. Everybody seemingly wanted him. And he was to represent all the people of the United States. And all of the people of the United States in electing him wanted him to do uh, any number of things, but they didn't want to pay taxes for all of the things that he was doing for them. And so uh, President Roosevelt, in order to meet the people's desire spent money beyond what he took in taxes, and so he had to borrow bank credit from the international bankers. And in borrowing that credit, he agreed to repay that credit in gold coin. And uh, by 1938, he had borrowed more bank credit than he had gold coin to repay. And so actually, at that point, all American citizens 
lost their status as free men and became juristic persons uh, in default of contract. But rather than have it admitted to all the people of the country that the nation was bankrupt, the lawyers figured out a way to cover that up, fact up in a little bit of legalese. And so the, the legalese they employed was to blend law with equity, which was done in 1938. Well, in the blending of law with equity, what they did is did away with law and made everything equity. But uh, it, they called it a blending. Now, officially, they said that this was just the form, uh, the forms, the uh, adjective part of the law, not the substantive part of the law, with no change in substance. But, uh, of course, if you don't challenge anything, anything the government does is, uh, it's a legalism, but it's presumed lawful. So when they blended law with equity, they made all courts equitable courts. And if you don't know enough to challenge it, well, you're stuck. So uh, they uh, blended law with equity, and that uh, uh, put us under an admiralty jurisdiction because, uh, you see, the loan of the money came from international bankers. And the minute you go into international banking, you're outside of the Constitution and the common law and now you come under merchant law or law merchant. And so under law merchant codes, uh, the American people were in servile status to the international bankers. Well, now you know what happens to anyone. The minute you are bankrupt, you lose your status as a free man and you come under a jurisdiction of compelled performance. Equity is compelled performance. And you can be compelled to perform in the interest uh, to the exact letter of a contract that you're under, or in uh, a bankrupt situation, you can be compelled to perform in the interest of your creditors. So, since 1938, the laws that are passed by Congress are not public law, as it has been formally known, but public policy. These are public policy statutes in the interest of the creditor. And so that is how you have the seatbelt law and all the rest. The, the, credit, the public creditor says, well, now these uh, bankrupt citizens there owe us all this gold. And there's only one way they can pay that gold, and that is to keep working. But these fools are riding around in their cars without buckling their seat belts and so on, and they're getting themselves killed, and dead men don't pay taxes. And so, in the interest of the international bankers, we want the legislatures of all the states to protect these citizens against themselves and compel them to buckle their seat belts. We want them alive so they can pay taxes. So this is how Mr. Freeman uh, got under this jurisdiction of compelled performance. Now, he must, uh, he has no rights under the Constitution. He is under an admiralty jurisdiction and he can be judged on the letter of the statute. The statute said he can't drive south on Maple Street. He drove south. That's the only fact that any jury will need to decide. The law says he's guilty. See, is, that's admiralty. Well, now, what could you do if you had a lawyer that really spelled it all out? <clears throat> of course, <clears throat> you know, he'd be like the bee that stung you. He, he's dead now. <laughs> he's going to die. Uh, he'd never be another lawyer. But if he did spell it all out, what could you do then? Well, you could do something right then. Because even under law merchant codes, <clears throat> and if you want the exact number of the code, toward the end of the book Pied Pipers of pa Babylon, he's got these laws, merchant codes, and you get the number of it. And it describes a valid contract. A valid contract is no different under international law than it is under American law. 
every valid contract must be entered into knowingly, voluntarily, and intentionally by both parties. So what do you do? You deny that a valid con international contract exists. Now you turn to the judge. No court in America is authorized to enforce or has jurisdiction to enforce an invalid contract. I deny the validity of the contract. So now you turn the whole complexion of the case from whether you drove the wrong way in a one-way street or failed to fasten your seatbelt into whether uh, the contract is a valid, uh, international contract is valid or invalid. Now you've got a whole new ball game and it's all at law and you've turned an equitable situation into a 100% law situation. And, uh, and I think you could win. So this is the uh, overall thing. But now there's a, uh, a Mr. Corrigan, he came up to me and he, yesterday and he showed me a letter that he got from a court. He asked him what the jurisdiction was and the judge said, uh, now this is four and a half. You see, we, I've got, uh, uh, well, I try to figure all the answers, but this is a new one. He says, yes, this is a criminal action under a common law jurisdiction modified by statutory law and case law. <laughs> now that is a, a new one. But uh, now what I, uh, well, yeah, I, I see, I don't want to give advice, uh, legal advice, because if I ever did that, I might wind up like uh, Ken Anderson and uh, spend time in jail. So I don't give legal advice. I wouldn't tell anybody what they should do. But, uh, you know, uh, my, the top of my, topic of my sermon is how sheep can survive in wolf country. And so... Just generally speaking, from a religious standpoint, uh, I would uh, say that uh, a sheep in that situation could probably best survive by writing the judge a return letter and say, well, uh, thank you, judge. Now, always remember uh, that the sheep are the good ones. Uh, and you want them to be the wolves, so uh, you'll be just as polite as he was, and it was a very polite letter that the judge wrote, so you write just as polite a letter in return, and thank him very much for his uh, attention, thank him for the letter, and, and uh, tell him, well now, uh, as you know, I have, you have said that I have a right to defend myself without a licensed attorney or any kind or anything, but uh, I have been unable to locate in any law library the rules of criminal procedure for common law jurisdictions modified by statutory law and case law. Now, there must be rules somewhere that I could obtain that would tell me exactly how to handle this case. And since I'm handling it myself, you know, Your Honor, that ju uh, justice requires that I be given the rules of the court. Uh, and uh, so would you, Your Honor, please either supply me with the rules of criminal procedure under common law jurisdiction modified by statute, uh, statutory uh, law and case law. I think that's the way it was worded. Just use his own words, see, and just write it out. And uh, now, you see, there is no such rules. So then when he can't supply you with the rules, and you have a right to defend, but they won't give you the rules of the court, but they he'll have to come around and advise him to get a licensed attorney. Then you uh, say, all right, right. Uh, but the, I'm allowed to defend this uh, myself. So uh, let the record of the case show that uh, this criminal action against whoever the person is, the sheep, uh, is a criminal action under a secret jurisdiction known only to licensed attorneys. See, they got to come up with the written rules of the court or it's secret. They say, they'll always tell you, please get a licensed attorney. We'll give you one. 
you, you won't you have to pay for it. And uh, that's their one way to get around it. You won't have to pay for it. They'll, they'll supply you with an attorney. But when they supply you with an attorney, he's there to make you lose. And uh, you don't want an attorney. You have a right. And right here in uh, the Wyoming Constitution, I'm close to the end, but I'll get... Now, what you want to do is to get your own Constitution. Here it is. Article 1, Section 10. In all criminal prosecution, the accused shall have the right to defend in person or by counsel. Well, you didn't choose to do it. You have a right to defend in person. And he said, well, you have a right to defend in person if you know, uh, you know law. Well, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that you, have to, you can defend in person if you're a licensed attorney. And say, well, I know law, but I uh, don't know this procedure. I don't know the, the rules of this court under the jurisdiction that's being claimed. And there's no written rules. How am I going to defend? I have a right to defend. And I have a right to know, but you're refusing to give me this. Now, if you want to set that jurisdiction, it's your duty to sh follow the Sixth Amendment and tell me that, uh, provide me with the rules for it, where I can get them. You see, uh, I think the case will be dropped if it's handled that way. And that's how we sheep can survive in wolf country. I think my time is up. And uh, so, uh, oh, oh, there is a little more there? Oh, I didn't, uh, my watch shows I'm done. <laughs> How much time have I got, Pete? Six minutes. I got a quartz watch here. Well, okay, that's fine. <laughs> well, now there was a, a question you had over here. Maybe we can answer that. Right? Yeah, well, uh, then you uh, tell the judge that the prosecuting attorney, that they were there by arraignment, and, he, and I've been there, but uh, it may not be. But uh, they're usually, you've got to have uh, somebody representing the, uh, the injured party, and he it represents the injured party. You're being arraigned. Ha uh, where, where is the injured party? And, uh, but if he isn't, you just tell the judge, have that prosecuting attorney prove as a fact of law. See, that, that was great. Yes, if you... Please. When you challenge the prosecuting attorney by not having a valid contract, yeah. is it possible that he will say, oh, yes, you do. You signed up for a driver's license? Uh, well... And you are obligated to no. obey all the rules. That, that would be a contract between you and the state, and if it's just a contract under American law, that's equity, and equity is, he's already established on the record it's a criminal action. Okay. Equity is a civil action. Well, if he does that, he might try to do that. Well, if he does that, say the Supreme Court has original jurisdiction. Okay. You're, this court doesn't have jurisdiction. Yes, Mr. Cargill. Uh, I'll tell you, it really shook them up when they had the hearing and they asked me to come forward and they said, Mr. Corgan, you plead guilty or not guilty. I said, I'm not pleading. I asked for a jury trial. And boy, they went to shuffling papers right now, you know. And uh, the judge looked over the secretary and said, Mr. Corgan, you asked for a jury trial. Will you set this on the calendar? And he said, I would like to have it. And I think it was a two or three week period. And she looked back at him and started shuffling papers and said, No judge, no judge, no judge, no. You know, it really shook them up when someone was asking something. Uh, but another question I have, would anyone have a Missouri Constitution that I might look at? Uh, well, you can go now, uh, you walk right to the Secretary of State's office in Wyoming, ask him for it, and they'll just hand you one. I've just got one day after I get home, though. Oh, boy. Yeah, but you should have it. That is very important. And then I want to give another point that he brought up there that where he made a mistake. You don't go in at arraignment and ask for a jury trial. The minute you do that, you've waived. See? Uh, if you're working on a jurisdiction issue, stay with that issue. The minute you ask for a jury trial, you've given them jurisdiction. 
and they don't have to tell you anything from that point on. You waived your rights under the Sixth Amendment. Yes. After you make your point as far as the jurisdiction, should you ask for dismissal at that time, or you just let them? Uh, yes. Them? Yeah. You have to ask. Uh, uh, after you point a, a challenge. Yeah. Uh, those yeah. Say, uh, uh, I move the court that the case be dismissed because, and then state the reason. Uh, there's a question back there. Oh, well, uh, uh, one of the things uh, that uh, if you want to uh, uh, sue a judge or something, uh, the best way to sue a judge, remember, we're sheep in wolf country. And you have a right to defend as a sheep. And if a wolf comes after you and you're a sheep, well, you can do what you can to defend yourself. And uh, one of the things that you can do if uh, they're coming after you and you, this judge is getting real uh, crude, is file a counter complaint at law uh, against the judge in that same case. Now, they can't throw your counter complaint out without throwing their own ca uh, case out. You see, if you go aggressively against a judge, you file a complaint against a judge, <laughs> the judges will throw it out. They'll say it's frivolous and out it goes. But now they're moving against you and you file a counter complaint. Now that's exactly what I have in the state of Wyoming. Uh, they have a misdemeanor against me. I drove the wrong way in a one-way street. I have a felony against them. They, uh, uh, and a counter complaint in which it's a violation of title, well, their problem is described in title 42, section 1983. The record shows that they fit the crime described in uh, title 42, section 1983, and the penalty that, for that crime is in Title 18, uh, Section 241, which says it's a $10,000 fine or 10 years in jail. That's a felony. So now I've got a counter complaint right in the uh, same case. It's all filed and it's in the Supreme Court of the state of Wyoming. Well, we're at a Mexican standoff. If they want to move after me on my one way, driving the wrong way on one way street, my counter claim is. Uh, and my counterclaim is at law, and the record, they know the record is against them. I've got, uh, got the record showing that they, all you got to do, what you, everyone should do, is to get a copy of Section 42, uh, I mean, uh, Title 42, Section 1983. Read it. And all the time you're running your case, you see, you put them uh, in violation of that. You see, uh, you call these things color of law. See, if anyone moves against you uh, under color of law and denies you of rights guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States, he is guilty of a crime. So you make him move against you under color of state law, denying you inalienable rights under the supreme law. And, but you could only do that if you're defending in a common law jurisdiction. If you're over an admiralty, uh, you don't do that. Then you uh, use an, you, you have to use admiral defenses. Yes, uh, Bob Larson. I have uh, couldn't quite hear you, but uh, come, can you come up here? Just get a little closer. Maybe you can speak right in the microphone. The people can hear it. Yeah, you, you have to have somebody, uh, yeah, he says if you don't have a, a prosecuting attorney present, uh, you can have the case dismissed. There's no, who is uh, representing the plaintiff? There's nobody there. Well, uh, then the case should be dismissed. So our, some judges may say, well, we'll get them here, or we'll, they'll fool around. They, they will violate the law right and left if you let them. But remember, every legalism is presumed lawful 
unless timely and specifically challenged for slothfulness. So you've got to think fast. Will I let that go or won't that? Oop. <laughs> you know, when Howard quit six minutes early, I thought, man, that rope must scare you to death. Then I realized what he had done. He is so shrewd, he threw me off guard. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, well, go ahead, Howard, go ahead. And then, then you give him a free raise. So you got to watch this man. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> All right, the ladies, uh, next class, 10 minutes over at the dining hall. Yes, Miss Parker.